thank you very much for your continued interest in philosophy. And uh, by the end of the talk, I'm, I'm trying to convince you that basically you are doing philosophy all the time. OK, so yeah, uh, this is Ryoanji in Kyoto. This is a rock garden in a Zen Buddhist temple. And it's a very peaceful place because you don't see all the tourists on the photo. <laughs> And if you want to talk about the purpose, well, there is a, a miniature model uh, as well. And the idea is that uh, you reach enlightenment by watching the pebbles, OK? And they don't move, so um, it requires quite some concentration. Well, OK, you can tell that I only have a, a pop culture level of understanding of Zen Buddhism, so that's not what I'm, I'm doing. But I'm doing something similar, because my way is to stare at some piece of code, OK? It's like for long until you see, uh, until you see the <coughs> light, OK? And uh, I also uh, ask questions. So well, the first question, what do I see when I look at the piece of code? And then I ask that, what do I see exactly when I, I try to remo remove all the hidden assumptions and all the unquestioned background knowledge I have? What's there? And it's like, is this a natural thing? OK, so it's natural, I mean, it's familiar for us. Or is something that needs some mental force applied? I think the friction is the right word in, uh, in software industry. And uh, also, I have to self-reflect. What do I do when I ask this question? And uh, yeah, sure, why am I doing this? Well, because I teach complete beginners uh, closure. And that means, oh, well, you might think that, oh, that's a uh, must be a boring task, but it's not. It's actually it's very helpful. So I um, so unless you have the discipline that you can focus your um, attention on a piece of code, you should find someone um, who can teach closure or programming because uh, you can <coughs> benefit a lot. Okay, so while well, the course went uh, three uh, uh, semesters already, and um, well, we are in the middle of nowhere. Uh, in rural Japan, and this is a, a liberal arts college, so not computer science uh, students. And uh, you can see I tried to market the course uh, very nicely. This was the first year, and then this, we had a winter semester, and then again a, a spring semester. OK, so, well, so what piece of code? And uh, well, you can, you can stare at this one, uh, and you can see the CS pink triangle, so you can see very nice things, but this is very, very complicated. This is not really good for uh, meditation. How about this one? Okay, this is a lot nicer. And you, and you can see, and it's like, wow, what's happening here? Is this something uh, natural? And it happens to be that, well, this is something very natural. That's what we do uh, all the time. And um, it's just uh, doing the same thing for a collection. Uh, by the way, you know, cognitive metaphors, you have to be careful because this is probably the worst ever example for immutability. Because <laughs> what happened to the oranges, right? Okay. Um, and also, uh, video use is also not too difficult. It's a very simple uh, story. And, uh, you know, students who didn't learn any other programming language before, they pick it up very quickly. And, um, but OK, what is going on, really, when, when you read this line? And uh, well, let's look somewhere else. OK, well, it's go, and it's uh, black to move and, and live. So what do you do? OK, well, you play it out in, in your head. OK, because well, when you are in game, you are not allowed to debug it, the situation, and then step over it. You have to play it out in your head. So reading code, you play it out in your head, that means your brain is the runtime. OK, that's what, what you do, you e execute it. And uh, something is something else is a very, very special relation. And uh, while well, my research is in abstract algebra, so I, I see semigroups and semigroup homomorphisms everywhere. But OK, let's just call it morphism. OK, and if you want a better word, call it emulation or, or simulation, or you can call it metaphor. What's going on here is that uh, you are in one system, as you can be your brain. For, for, for example, let's just do some arithmetic. Well, you might be able to get from x to x, y. That's the result of the calculation. But it's a very long process. Therefore, you map the input into the computer. Not, OK, t is the computer now. 
and that can do the calculation very fast, and you just map the result back. Well, this is the idea of computing, right? Uh, but when you do reading the code, that means that, well, you want to play that out in your, in your head. So that, actually, that's why uh, programming is difficult, because our brain is, is a completely different hardware. Um, so yeah, when you play it out, what machine is in the head? And um, I do recommend to look up some computer science education research, because they are doing quite nice work. So uh, have you ever heard of the notional machine? Yeah, that's what I expected, uh, because I also didn't hear about it until I ran into problems in, in teaching uh, programming, and I looked it up. And there is a very nice survey article by a, a Finnish researcher, so while well, here is the link, uh, please look it up. And the idea is that um, when you understand the, the program, well, you have to build a mental model. And, uh, you know, most people are not in the 8-bit uh, generation anymore. They don't have a full understanding of the full stack, not just front and back end, but, you know, bit and logic and uh, your application. So they have to build some abstract computer. And, uh, well, okay, if you do assembly programming, then, well, it's exactly uh, the notional machine is the chip uh, registers. If you do object-oriented programming, well, you have to build a network of objects in your head, and they communicate. Okay? And if you do functional, well, that's a pretty easy one, because that's just a substitutional model. And this is kind of a bad news for hybrid languages, because that means that their notional machine contains two and the interaction. So that's why the people who want to make it easy, and they don't go to the pure languages, actually, they are a um, lot worse off because they have to do way more work. So yeah, uh, morphisms are everywhere. As a reading code, your brain imitates the machine execution. And my definition of, of a computer is something that emulates another computer. Okay? Well, uh, so computerness is spread by uh, uh, morphisms. And de developing software, well, what, what is it exactly? Well, uh, you need a computational process that models a piece of reality. Okay, so basically what you are interested in, understanding reality. Now that's uh, one argument that you are already doing uh, philosophy. So, okay, yeah, let's go for it. What is programming? And, uh, well, we can say that we write text, which on a suitable computational device creates a process whose outcome is some desirable output, or its dynamics is some required behavior uh, modeling a piece of reality. And I would like to distinguish, because programming, well, this is pretty involved, uh, but people use coding as a, as a synonym, and um, I would like to make it coding is just a small part of it, because while imagining this computational process, that's the big work, and, and describing it in a language, that's the smaller part. So actually, what I did, I have programming exercises, and I have coding exercises. Coding exercises that, well, here's the problem, here's the plan in plain English, how can we can solve the problem, and you just do the coding. And students said that, well, okay, that's, that's a good thing to, to go. And if you are, well, okay, it's like programming is modeling a piece of reality, well, it's, uh, here's the bad news, it's another <coughs> good book. So, well, reality is, is rather uh, complicated, and... Um, we will al always have just an approximation of the reality. And if we have a model which is good enough uh, predicting uh, what we want, then, well, <coughs> we are sort of happy. So here's another bit of encouragement. Uh, programming is a highly unnatural activity. Okay, so one of the top guys. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show now. I, I will go through some examples from the, the classroom. Well, okay, here is the other one. Functional collection processing is a map filter and, and reduce, that's very natural, okay? And, and it's easy, easy to get. Um, predicate functions, answering yes or no questions, well, that's again, that's coming from uh, real life. And then, you know, it, it, this is a, a preconception I had. I said that, well, okay, what makes filter great is that we have truthy and falsy, right? Uh, and then uh, you can do this. You can filter out all the ones. Right? And I was happy to present this, and the students look back, and it's just, okay, wh wh what is it exactly? Then I have to think that, oh, yeah, uh, this is probably something that is not really natural. Because in real life, when you ask that, well, <coughs> 
do you want to eat something? And you say apple. Well, it's the, would the other person take it as a yes? Well, okay, okay that maybe apple is, is uh, this is a good example for that. But it's like uh, we want to have a, a yes or, or no. And it, it, it makes sense if you come from other programming languages where you have to do some more work um, to do this. And then, then you appreciate it. So here's a, another example problem. And um, so you have to, uh, to write a function that replaces uh, characters <coughs> in a string, and you are given a character-to-character -character, uh, hash map. Okay. And then, well, you have to um, return the one uh, that contains the change. So, well, the first bit is that's the example how it should look like. And, um, of course, by this time the students know that, well, okay, yeah, this is very nice. The, the hash map can be uh, used as a function because it's really just a, a lookup uh, function. And I can do that. Well, of course, it doesn't really work because uh, you get nil when there is no, nothing there. So, well, uh, they very quickly realize that uh, this, this happens. So one solution is that they have to do a bit more work. They have to have an, an anonymous function where you can actually have this, uh, this default value. Okay? And this was, was a real problem. I had to explain this many times. Then I thought about it, and why does this happen? Well, because this is quite an unnatural situation. It's like, you know, what's the time? And if you don't know it, just please tell me it's noon. Okay. So, we never did this. It's like, what, what's your favorite color? And if you, if you don't have any, just tell me red. And it's just, yeah. <coughs> it, it takes time to understand that, uh, why, why this is good. And uh, I like situations when, uh, you know, students is call me. I, I, I do this patrolling and I look at the screen. And um, then it's like, okay, here's my solution. And sometimes I look at it and it's just, Oh, okay, does this work? And they say, yeah, it, it does. Because, well, then it's a problem for me because I don't really see why this works. Um, but then uh, if you look at it, then you can see it, uh, clearly why this works. Well, of course, there are always, uh, in the first solution by students, there are always some twists. So, for example, you don't need to take the sequence of the word. Uh, but what happens here, that the, for some reasons the student uh, repeated the word twice, that means that map takes two inputs and those, uh, puts those two uh, into, oh, okay, well, actually, I made a typo, then uh, X should be M. Um, because, well, uh, the, the student's naming is always X, so it's like I tried to at least improve uh, that solution. So, yeah, with map, it, it, it did work out, so that was uh, another thing that I could uh, explain. Okay, so tradition versus present time. Here's the example, write a function, sum of digits that returns the sum of the digits of a given number. Okay, so, well, I, I talked about that, well, how you can uh, explore, the, um, well, first turn into a string, and then you have the characters, and then um, you, can, you can think about um, just giving those values. Um, or, of course, you can do the arithmetic way and, uh, and figure those out. So, for the, the sub-problem of having a, a character containing a digit, and you want to convert it to a numerical value, well, what's the tradition? Well, you know, the, there is this ASCII table, and you take the value and the subtract the ASCII value of A, uh, the, the zero, and, uh, and that's what you do. But, you know, you have to do every, every, everything. You have to know about the binary representations and the code tables, and it's like, uh, well, with the Commodore 64, you learn that, but uh, students, they don't know it. So I, I, I purposefully uh, try to push them in the direction that, well, you can just use a hash map, right? It's basically you, you want to map uh, character digits to the, the values. And, uh, well, that's what they did. And, the, and this was another one. I was walking, and it's like, oh, yeah, this is bad. <laughs> then, I, then I looked at it, and it's like, oh, okay. So, well, it's... Uh, it is not that bad, because I, I told the students that, well, yeah, sure, you don't want to have the map hanging around in your global namespace, because then your function, you know, depends on it and someone changes. So it's like, well, you have to, to put there. And I also told them that, well, a let statement is just like a micro-universe. It's like, well, you, you define meaning within that. And here's the combination. Well, the function inside just captures this uh, temporal environment, and it's 
and it's all good. Well, um, it may not confirm most of the coding conventions, but well, <coughs> it worked fine. Okay, so yeah, we have to talk about uh, types. Um, so the original uh, assumption is that if you want to uh, teach complete uh, beginners, then you need to, to reduce uh, the amount of uh, concept you want to say. And of course, uh, the type is sort of a natural uh, concept in, in, in a way that well, we, know we have numbers and we have uh, text, so that's fine. So we just don't uh, really talk about it. Uh, but here is what happens. This is the, the, the moment when I, I thought that, well, maybe we need uh, to talk about it. As I call it a double uh, packaging. This is a typical mistake. It came up many times. And um, so what happens? Uh, of, of course, uh, the function doesn't work. And I asked the students, so why, why did you put, it, put X, which is, well, okay, Carol's naming. I, I tell them that if you call it at least V, that you are better off because it's... Um, you sort of remember that it's a, it's a vector. They never do it. Uh, but then, so why, why, why did you put it into a, a vector? Be and the answer is that, well, because well, at some point I, I had to say somewhere that it's a vector, right? So that, there is an instinct here um, to say that. So, um, um, well, I, actually, at this point, I, I thought then, um, yeah, I have quite uh, a freedom in. Um, in, in choosing the uh, curriculum. And I'm thinking to switching for at least one semester to Haskell, okay? Because I went through uh, the whole course uh, three times saying that whenever you get an exception, just don't read it because it's written in another language, okay? So it's like totally no information there. You go back to the code and just reread it to yourself. Try to, to read what you wrote there. And most of the time it helps. So that means, that we can teach a language without just without looking at the error messages at all. Okay. Well, it's uh, probably not the best approach, and I know that there is work uh, in, in closure in that direction now. But um, I'm sort of toying with the idea of uh, of trying that. Okay. So here is the philosophical argument: is that well, if programming is about understanding the word. Well, that's, uh, what do we do first? That's a very basic thing is, uh, you know, categorizing things. And there are different kinds of things. And that's, um, you know, it's a very fundamental to uh, intelligence itself. And also what is not uh, written down, that you have to keep it in your head, right? That gives you some, um, no, and it's like, well, the conclusion is inescapable. Well, we need types and we need, um, um, Statics times. Uh, but then if you think about there is another tendency, right? Um, the history of programming languages is, has another tendency as well to get closer to the uh, to natural language, okay? And these two are actually in, in conflict. And that explains why, why there is an opportunity to, for uh, flame wars in, in this topic. So I'm, I'm not trying to decide this. I'm just trying to figure out that why this is a topic. Uh, as well. So there are two uh, tendencies. And, uh, and not just we don't do uh, static typing in natural language, we also don't do it in mathematics. Okay, because, well, okay, th this is a bit more precise notion of the homomorphism, let's say with two algebraic structures, S and T, and it's usually just said that, well, we have phi and we, uh, that's how we move from, uh, move from S to T. And, uh, we just use concatenation for the multiplication or, or composition, okay? And you have to play it out in your head that there are two different operations. One operation, one multiplication is happening in, in S and the other one is happening in, in T. And if you make, well, uh, if you make the type explicit, well, then it's, um, it's more uh, readable. And uh, I think many students in algebra, they have to, uh, Pass this stage and understanding uh, this, then it's fine, you know, to talk about. Well, at least I had to do this for for a long time. I couldn't really uh, get the idea of homomorphism until I was like, oh, okay, it's two different operations. So here's another game we uh, like very much, and it's, uh, the story is that the evil wizard took away map, filter, and remove, okay, but made a mistake and left reuse. So can we recover from the blow? And it's well, 
if you, if you haven't done it yet, I do recommend this is a very nice exercise and it's, again, it hammers it down that what happens exactly in, in map uh, filter and, and remove. Then, of course, the enemy realizes the mistake and takes uh, away uh, reduce as well. And um, so we only have recursion. And are we still okay? Well, okay, you can just do reduce by recursion and it's, uh, you see that everything comes back. And in mathematics, this is called searching for uh, foundations. You, you look for the minimal set, the generating set that uh, can recover everything. And okay, so here, is the, uh, here are the overarching statements and, um, and a bit of practical advice. So my overarching statements are that well, mathematics, programming, philosophy, and, and writing, they are sort of well, same-ish, okay? Um, and uh, their unified essence is having a shared understanding of the word helped by, and that's the critical point, offloading our cognitive processes to suitable languages, okay? And if you look at that, well, yeah, I say that when you write a book, it's basically source code for a very special computer, which is the human brain, okay? So libraries are libraries uh, in both uh, sense. So the take-home uh, message is that, uh, well, pick a piece of code and meditate over it. And, uh, and if, it, if it, you find this difficult, then find someone um, who wants to learn uh, programming and, uh, and try to <coughs> explain to that uh, person. And also, uh, if, you are, uh, if you are thinking that, well, Okay, these statements are a bit uh, wild, then I'm happy to talk to you because that's, uh, that's what I, I like to, to discuss. Okay, so, well, some sort of conclusion. Uh, programming is as difficult as understanding the word, because, well, it is understanding the word, and the coding part is easy, okay? It's very, it's very strange. Uh, I totally like communities around uh, languages, but it's, you know, that's the small part of it, okay? So... Well, uh, that's the conclusion. Well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Attila. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions, if, if you have any. Thank you, Panu. Um, the, uh, the thing that I find uh, most um, kind of hard to, uh, the hardest to understand in programming processes is how people come up with the initial code for something. Like it's, it's, it's much harder to understand uh, the, uh, than, for instance, uh, what they think when they see some code that was already written. But when they are faced with a, an empty screen, mm -mm. what is the process of creating code after some kind of hint of what they want to have done. Like, that's, uh, do you have any insight about that? Because it's very mysterious for me. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a very good question. There are um, different things. Uh, one is that uh, they usually come up with a solution which is very, very complicated. And, and we try to understand that why the first solution is so complicated. And it, it, uh, my hunch is that what happens is that when they try different things, they don't erase. And the problem changes because you don't just have the original problem, but then you, you have this half attempt as well. And you have to code around that, that <coughs> one as well. And that's why I say when, when it finally works, uh, I tell the students that, well, okay, that's a good start. This is not the ending. This is where learning can start. Because now if you look back, you can, you can find it. Uh, but so how this happens? Well, there is a methodology. It's coming from uh, the heuristics in mathematics and um, the how to solve it. It's a classic work in, in mathematics. And uh, I actually did that in, in this semester. I, I translated that heuristics into the language uh, of, of programming. So it's like it's really the same how to, so how to code it, uh, heuristics for programming fun in functional languages. All right, thanks. Anyone else? Yeah, sure. How do I do it? Um, 
I, I guess, I don't know if this, this almost is one of those annoying uh, uh, things, questions that isn't really a question, but I found the talk really interesting because I essentially sort of used to do something like this. When I was first learning uh, programming, uh, I was introduced through the Racket community to a lovely book called The Little Schemer. Mm -hmm. And because I was in a Finnish language course uh, that was like eight hours a day and I had very little free time, my method of practicing programming was to read The Little Schemer on the bus and try to do all of the programming exercises in my head uh, without the benefit of any kind of repo. Uh, it was helpful because the book will eventually give you the answer. Uh, but it walks you through it in a way that uh, I guess if you haven't read it, uh, it might be very helpful to your mm. uh, approach, um, especially when it comes to pedagogy and, and that sort of oh, thing. Yeah, that book was very much part of the uh, preparation for this course. Yeah. And, and that's exactly that happened. You, have to, you really have to play it out in your head. And that's why, uh, you know, some people use the debuggers just to understand the code. So it's like a routine thing just to step through. I think that sort of has a, a limited uh, benefit in, in, in that sense, because you are just w watching it. And it's, it's very similar when, when you train for playing Go. There are websites now, and uh, you are allowed to click through, and it's fine, OK, what happens? Yeah, you don't really learn anything, because you re really have to play it out in the head. And one more thing, if you uh, check what um, you know, professional uh, programmers say in interviews about programming, this playing it out in the head, this appears almost everywhere. Thanks. Uh, Anaya, I have a question for you. Are you more fluent in racket than in Finnish? <laughs> I think there's irony in it. What you said just. <laughs> Anyone else? One more, maybe. Yeah, thanks, you. Yeah, well, this is one of those, not really a question, but a comment type of things again. But uh, I think this whole discussion about reading code and uh, like thinking about what it does really resonated with me since I just worked through the uh, panels a quiz about what do these pieces of closure code do. <laughs> So please, everybody, have a look at that if you did it already. <laughs> it was great fun. 